Hey, Alicia. Hey there. Hey, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, man. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing okay. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing not too bad, actually, to be honest okay. with you. I mean, like, it's been a bit of a, like, interesting time with the whole lockdown situation. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I feel like every day feels like a week and every week feels like a month. And at the same time, it all feels like it happened yesterday. I don't know. Yeah, it's like as if, uh, I mean, like, it's usually around this time of year, I'd be in the middle of the field somewhere. Like, right, if, right. Festival season. Oh, yeah, definitely. Especially in the UK. But, like, festival season is a very, very, very big thing sort of thing. Right, uh, right. So usually I'd be, like, kind of under, under a canvas roof somewhere. <laughs> like, like, kind of running like Superman across a field just to try and catch as many things as possible. Definitely, definitely. We've actually been watching like uh, live sets from festivals just to like feel like we're like a little bit in season. Yeah, well, I've been watching. I've been doing the same thing. So I've been mm -hmm. watching lots of artists doing live streams. But yeah. As much as I've enjoyed some of them, some of them have been really brilliant. But it's not quite the same. No, it's not. You know, being in the room because of, especially. For someone like myself, it's it's about like kind of more than just the bands. It's about like kind of everything which goes along with it. Right, right. It's running into that friend that you didn't expect to see at the show. You know, it's all that meeting new people. Just the, like the mental stimulus of it all. It's like I don't know. I'm such like a control freak that like those parts that I don't plan. Like that's the part that I really look forward to. Well, it's also the thing is that I'm I'm such a like whereas I actually find that. I mean, I struggle with a lot of social situations, so whereas gigs give me that controlled environment. Yeah, definitely. You know, so you can have like, right, okay, it's a bit like kind of gigs and cinema and theatre sort of thing where you know that there's going to be a central reason why you're going to be there. Right, and everybody's there because they like the same thing. <laughs> or, or, like, or, or like the fact that sometimes you don't know what you're going to expect, which can, which can also be you know, quite an amazing thing, really. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I, uh, and I think people, like, I remember when we first started the band, like, some people were surprised that they're like, well, you know, aren't you nervous going up on stage or whatever? And it's like, at least I yeah. know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know what you're doing. <laughs> we have, like, a structure. <laughs> so it's like you've got some sort of, like, kind of, I guess it's a bit like, you know, when you're forming a band, sometimes you're building up a bit of a bond. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. You know that you're not going to be entirely on your own. But... Yeah, there's that too. There's that. You've always got people to watch your back, always. Um, I don't I... know how solo artists do it, to be quite honest. <laughs> it, 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 it can be a struggle. I think, I think that's the thing is that you've got to kind of, in a weird way, like invent a, like a separate character. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, because there's so many artists that I can think of who are technically kind of like kind of solo artists, but they've invented a split personality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What was that thing about Bowie saying that like he had a really hard time writing for himself? Like he could write for Lou Reed, he could write for Iggy. Yeah. So like he almost had to like make up people within himself to write for, which I, I can see how you could get there. <laughs> if, if you think about it, it's like as if you've got to present a version of yourself. And it's like learning how to deal with the publicity and like the expectations. Mm -hmm. Like kind of off stage, how can you live a like, you know, split be like to try and be as normal as possible, really? Yeah, yeah, there is a bit of that. And, you know, I think you find yourself in a lot of situations that you don't expect to find yourself in. And so, uh, who was it? It was actually, um, you know, Conan O'Brien, the talk show host? Yeah. He had a really good bit where he said, um, you know, I'll find myself talking to the Pope or whatever. And he said, uh, you just have to act as if it's normal. Yeah. Even if it's not. Just right now, just pretend that it's normal and it'll eventually feel normal. Yeah. I guess it's a bit like the same when sometimes when being a fan of certain artists and you do sometimes meet them and you've got to go, right, instead of like going to go like obsessively obsess like you know, kind of obsessing them, you've got to go like, right, they're a human being. You yeah. Know? I've you're I've only been nervous a couple of times. <laughs> like, um, uh, I remember we played a festival last summer and uh, Ride played. Yeah. And uh, 
just like tentatively walking up to Andy Bell and just being like, oh, hi, <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh God, what am I going to talk to him about? You know, but it was fine. <laughs> oh God, I get like that all the time. Mm. Even, like some of my neighbors, because like um, where I live in Bristol, um, mm -hmm. like I, I have John Parrish who lives a couple of streets away from me. His, right. Harvey's kind of like co-songwriter and producer. Right, right. <laughs> He was, he's, he's a real sweetheart, like, cause I've met him quite a few times, but I still get really awkward. Mm -hmm. They could, like, the heebie jeebie kind of teen fanboy sort of thing. Could have kicked. Yeah. So, no, so I can't help but think of, you know, like the records that he's worked on and that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, for sure. The one that, like, constantly comes around in Chicago is, like, you'll be at a record shop and you'll look across the way. And it'll be Steve Albini, you yeah. know, the because <laughs> his dude is like here in Chicago, and so like I still have never talked to him, but I've, like I've definitely seen him across the room a couple times. I've like, I've actually drawn him before because I've oh, I've, really? I've taken to sometimes doing drawing at gigs. Mm -hmm. So one of the people, so I went to see Shellac about mm -hmm. in October, and so quite often I'd turn up, I'd, I'd be down the front with um, like my sketchbook and like a whole load of like kind of watercolor pens mm -hmm. be like kind of like kind of drawing them whilst they're playing yeah that's awesome yeah it was great apart from like i got i had bob weston you know comically have a go at me <laughs> <laughs> i imagine watercolor is not the hardest or not the easiest one to have at a venue like i'm surprised <laughs> you didn't get jostled around you know oh yeah exactly but that's the whole fun of it is sometimes is to is to do it to prove that you can do this to like it's a stunt almost, you know, like. <laughs> like I did stuff like, like JPEG Mafia. Mm. Oh, yeah, that'd be wild. <laughs> yeah, that would be wild. I mean, <laughs> he actually had to leave the stage twice to go, go and get air because if he was on the verge of passing out. Wow. It was, wow. It was like last June, so it was absolutely boiling hot. It was like <laughs> 30 degrees centigrade. Um, oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> feel the sweat dripping off the ceiling. Mm hmm Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely been to a few gigs like that. <laughs> oh, haven't we all? Then yeah. that, that used to be part of the fun of it though, really. I know. I mean I would take the most miserable room right now. <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah, so would I to be honest. I, I mean like that's I mean yeah, I guess I guess I'd go, go, go back on how I could have semi come across you guys. It's gonna be a bit random, but um it was it was three pitchfork I think they they do like a like a weekly like ten best new tracks sort of thing, mm -hmm. and you were on it with uh, this is the kid who I'm really really good friends with, um like uh, Madeline Kenny, uh like Lonnie Holly and mm -hmm. it's um one of your songs and I was like this is good, <laughs> so th th this is interesting. <laughs> Thanks, thank you. Yeah, we, we're really, really happy that uh, with this new record, it seems like people internationally are getting a little bit more of a listen um, because our tastes, we listen to stuff from everywhere. Yeah. Um, and that was something that we were hoping actually to do this year was this was a year that we were going to shoot for maybe in the fall going to the UK. Obviously, that's not going to happen. No. But maybe, you know, next year or something like that because... I don't know, the scene over there just seems so, I don't know, it, it seems different in tone. It just seems really refreshing from like an American perspective. Yeah. And there's just like some really interesting, fun stuff going on. Like, uh, oh, here's a good example. So do you know the band Sports Team? Yep. I know so well. they, did, they did like a, a, little, a little tour of the United States. And I think that maybe they were just kind of like gauging interest. Yeah. This is before the record even came out, and um, it was on Halloween, yeah. and I saw it like months in advance, and I asked the venue, I was like, sports team is rad, yeah. can we, we'll play that bill with them, mm. and they were like, sure, so like, you know, it was us and sports team, and they wound up being so cool, we like went out to a bar afterwards, but like the vibe was so different than like an American touring band. Yeah. And obviously they've just done so well, you know, <laughs> over in the UK, but like they're sweethearts. It's taken off. It's, it's been like yeah. one of the most kind of probably, along with idols, is been the most unexpected success story. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like I've known the guys in idols for like 10 years, sort of thing. Really? 
Yeah. Well, Wait, aren't they from your town? From Bristol, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like both, both the singer and the bass player. Um, I'd, they'd, they'd be, they'd be, there was a whole period when they were kind of starting out that I was trying to semi avoid them and I couldn't because of like, <laughs> and you, they'd always be working on the bar. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's so strange now too with the internet. It's weird that there's still like a little bit like of a divide like between the like, UK and US because like with sports team, like, I like would send their music to all my friends and say like you have to come to this show like this is going to be like a really good show and you're never going to see them in a room this small like again um and everybody I sent it to they loved it but nobody knew who they were yet and then the album gets announced and then you know people started hearing about and they're like they came through last year you know it's like the same one with idols it's like the first record, Brutalism, like, I knew a couple people that, like, knew about it, but it really wasn't until Joy's, Joy of an Act of Resistance that much more people that I knew knew who they were, in the U.S., at least. And it, I guess it's kind of the same the other way around, you know? I don't know if, like, American bands hit a little bit later there. I think, it's, I think sometimes, but then sometimes you have the odd occasions where you'll have bands, like, I'm going to take a random, punt, random one, like the Scissor Sisters. Mm -hmm. it, bigger in the UK and Europe than they were in the US. Right, right. But, but then, like, on the reverse, you could have stuff like, I mean, I don't know, take a band like Depeche Mode, for instance. Mm. Like, it was still really big in the UK, but they're much, yeah. much, much, much bigger in the US, so much more, they had much bigger impact, mm -hmm. I think. Um, yeah, I find that kind of weird, because sometimes you get, like, kind of, like bands who sometimes won't even make it in their own country, yet yeah. they'll, they'll go to somewhere like Japan and they'll be like a, like over a million selling record. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. Like I'm always like, whenever we ship out a record, the two ones that I'm always surprised by are Japan mm -hmm. and like Argentina, like South America. Like those two are like the ones where I'm always like, really? Okay. Well, like, <laughs> Then I can kind of understand it at the same time because I think that what they basically pick up on is the energy. They yeah. may not always understand, you know, like the lyrical context. Mm -hmm. They'll always understand like the emotion. Yeah, that's true. I did listen to a lot of Japanese music, uh, like as a teenager, like old like Japanese post punk stuff, like Chance Operations, like a really good band, or like a Buck Tick. So I guess I could, I could see that maybe like it's it's in there. <laughs> And the influences in the back of my head but i think that we all take but i think we take also the, from listening to the stuff on your new record um i, I very much also like the way that you've taken like expectations of what post-punk can be but then also slightly subverted it and yeah we uh it makes sense because it's like we've got like a wide age range of people in the band. And then obviously like it's half women, half men. Yeah. So like, I think like when you start out and like you don't look like other bands, you any influences that you pick up are gonna look different when you wear them. Hmm. And so I think like for us, it's like obviously like there are bands that we love like Sonic Youth or like the birthday party or something like that. But like being in Chicago, it's like we love shellac and like Big Black and like all that kind of like Chicago sound Jesus Lizard. But then, like, Brian, our drummer, loves Britpop. Like, is, like, he's the biggest. Like, I've listened to so much Oasis at this point that, like, I think I got Stockholm Syndrome into kind of liking Oasis. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm more of a pulp gal myself, but, like... Oh, amazing. Definitely. Yeah. Totally. Totally. So, it's, like, you take all these, like, really different people, and when you put them in a band together, it's, like, all these different influences, like, smashed together. But, like... I think the funniest part is like when we're on the road, everybody has a band that they absolutely love that everybody else hates. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's like, but then it's like the same with me, you know, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I mean, like I would say that I'm basically like an obsessive compulsive gig goer. Yeah. It's basically how I built my reputation is by basically turning up being a fluky git and just like going, right, this band sounds really interesting. Yeah. Let's see what this is all about. Yeah, definitely. And it's like, it's cool that you get to like see people at different points in their career too, because like, I feel like it's very easy to be like a very surface music lover. It's different when you get to go see like a band's like first time around. You yeah. Know? Like if I, if we hadn't played that sports team gig, I would have just gone because I just wanted to see what they were all about, you know? Well, it's like, I remember seeing, that's the reason why like, I became like, 
one of the main ambassadors for Independent Venue Week is because of which is who we're doing the chat through. Um, because of um, like my favourite venues aren't the bigger venues; they're like the smaller, 150, 200 capacity rooms. So, like places like in Bristol, like the Louisiana, mm -hmm. is a cracking venue. I mean, actually, that's one of the venues which Joe from Idols used to work at. Oh, okay. For like a few years, but it's it's if you ever get a chance to come on over, you've got to come and play the Louisiana. It's yeah. it's one of those. Um, just look at the tour posts. Just look at the posters of the people who played there, and your tour will literally hit the ground. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we've got like, a couple of those over here in Chicago too, and like, of course, we're all worried about the venues that we love. Like over here, we've got Empty Bottle is like the one that's like our our home turf venue, and like, yeah, if anything happens to that place, like that's <laughs> I will be so bummed out. But they're just such institutions, you know. It's like that's where scenes are made. That's where friendships are made. It's like they are so much more important than just like a room where a band plays music. Like it's so much more than that. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're heritage but, in, my, in my point of view. They are heritage. They are, you know, they should be viewed as churches as, you know, like, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, like as if in like the way which religious buildings are protected because they're, they're so much more than just the room. It's like they build communities. Oh like, yeah. Churches would have done in the past sort of thing. Like, yeah for sure and it's like there's nothing I, I you know I don't mind going to a gig by myself and like I can think of like like I, there was a time where like I you know if you have something like really bad going on I had a, a, a three-day pass to uh, go see Gary Newman do like a residency at a small theater and uh, just like seeing the same artist three nights in a row do different albums like in, in one place yeah uh, it was just like it, it kind of it helped like I, I think people need to realize, like you were saying, that like these are just like cultural institutions that need to be protected. But, but it's also like for someone like myself, it actually helped me overcome certain like mental health barriers. Sort mm -hmm. of, in case of like, I would I would have to turn up to the shows really early, and I'd always go and find go and find my spot kind of like generally down the front because mm -hmm. this is my space. If you <laughs> They come and say hi to me you've got to come into my space mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah definitely like I, I feel like uh for us it was like i think the thing that was interesting on that kind of level is like you know as like a person that has like depression and anxiety like i feel like it ha a having like music to funnel it into obviously is important but b like knowing like there's some stuff that we've done that i think before the band i would have said oh there's no way like there's no way that I would play like a festival stage. Are you kidding me? Like, what if I mess up? What if you know? What if I fall? Like, <laughs> and now it's like I can look back and say that I did that. Um, and I will say I'm a little less nervous every time now that we've done it. You know, for five years, I'm, I can, I can just take it, take the punches a little bit better. You know. But also, I think it's still good to have slightly have those nerves because of uh, like I get nervous even before coming on here and doing <laughs> that because of. It means that you kind of care. Yeah, that's that's very true. Like I think uh, people don't uh, don't talk down uh, the bad side of being overconfident <laughs> enough because <laughs> that is a thing. <laughs> definitely, yeah. I mean, it, it definitely is. I mean, but then I think it's because I think that's the thing. I think that if you explain to people that there's, I mean, I think that's part of going back onto like. The reason why some people like develop split personalities, mm -hmm. you know, like so, like you have like Iggy Pop, for instance, Iggy Pop on stage, complete wild man. Off stage, he's Jim Osterberg. He's like, you yeah, know, <laughs> this, like kind of brown jacket sort of thing. Yeah, we got like uh, so Charlie. Um, yeah, we're hoping that like with this lockdown and everything happening, that we might do like a recorded video set somewhere because. Most of the videos that are online are just people's like cell phone videos of us. But Charlie is kind of a wild man. He kind of like thrashes around and he's kind of like a fish out of water. <laughs> uh, but uh, in honesty, like he has his hair over his face. Like you'd think that he's some macho guitar guy. But in reality, I know that like it makes him nervous to look at the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> but that's just the reality of it like it has nothing to do with like looking cool or whatever he just like literally doesn't look up 
like the same with like some of the singers. You know, like when you know, um, like for instance, someone like Lemmy from Motorhead. Mm. The mic angled like he did, just because if he, he it's, it's partly because he didn't like looking at people's faces. Yeah. You know, and it's and I can fully understand that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm I'm sure I've confused a lot of bartenders. My thing is like I will just look over everybody's head and like if the bar is in the back, I'll just make eye contact with like the bartender. That's like my. <laughs> so it's like a potential focal point that you'll have. Exactly, exactly. And like I figure everybody kind of thinks I'm looking at them when in reality I'm just kind of like right over them. So you're looking. Guess... At, it's like in a weird way, like kind of staring up into the middle distance yeah yeah there's a little bit of that and like you know most of the time when you play gigs anyways it's like you start and you're nervous and then suddenly you're on the last song and you're like wait a minute what happened to the middle <laughs> or, or, or you kind of like you just kind of start off kind of nervously but then all of a sudden within a few seconds it just kind of kicks in yep yep definitely and then it kicks in and then it's all like kind of over yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think on both sides, going to shows and playing shows, I think you kind of know within the first song of like what kind of gig it's going to be. <laughs> well, also, like, sometimes it's like for me hearing a new piece of music, sometimes within the first couple of sections, I can pick up so much information that I can kind of like depend, like, mm -hmm. whether I like something or not. Usually yeah. The first couple of seconds. Yeah, I mean, just even like the tone of the crowd, like I'm thinking of, I went and saw Idols um, at like a, a medium-ish sized venue in Chicago. And like, I've been to other shows at this venue before, but just how big the mosh pit started, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is going to be absolute bedlam, absolute insanity. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go hide out by the bar because I can tell how this is gonna go down. Christ. I <laughs> I've I've seen a few of theirs. I've seen a fair few of their pits. I mean, they've had to sometimes. I mean, like the last time they played, I saw them play Bristol, which was they headlined like SWX, which is one of Bristol's biggest venues. Yeah. Thousand capacity sort of thing, and yeah. they stopped the show because they basically crashed the barrier. Oh shit. Yeah. They 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 it was it was like, well, I also ended up on stage with them, and it took about yeah. people to actually lift me up onto stage because yeah. Sick, and I'm quite a big person. Mm -hmm. So like, um, remember, kind of like being lifted over the barrier, and then like, I had to have like three security men almost lift me up, like kind of grab both my feet, and then have like people on stage always just like kind of pull me up. Uh -huh. But basically, I kind of fell off like as if I kind of upside down dead donkey. Oh my god, that's so funny. Limbs in the air. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to think of like another one. Okay, so one that we played that was really crazy was we did we did two nights in a row with, you know, Daughters? Yes. Oh, God, Daughters. Freaking hell. Yeah. So oh. it was uh, us, JJL, and Daughters. Oh, two nights. Well. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was a stacked bill. And, like, I've loved Daughters forever. And we got an email out of the blue um, asking us to play this show. And I thought you know, surely like somebody told them about us, but in reality, Nick, their guitarist is just a huge nerd. Yeah. <laughs> and he's the one that like went out and found all these bands like in the different regions to play with. Um, but we were all shoved into a very, very small green room the first night. So it was like before the show, pack show. So we can't really leave the green room. And it was so funny because we were all like, like, just like changing and stuff because there was just no room for us to like have any privacy. And we play, JJL plays, and then when Daughters hit, because it was their first shows, I think Chicago might have been the first or the last of that tour, but they hadn't played Chicago since they had broken up. In insanity. Like, I've never seen a room blow up like that before. It was so funny. Charlie ended up sur crowd surfing our guitarist. Like, it was, <laughs> it was wild. <laughs> I saw them in Bristol on that same tour. And mm -hmm. um, the singer cut himself open. Yeah, yeah, he, as he was one to do. <laughs> oh, it was like, it was like one of those sorts of things where you just kind of go, how the freaking hell do you cope with if you're doing that to yourself, to your body every single night? 
yeah i mean the shows that we did with them it was crazy because it was like just when the new record came out and they like they booked like a couple of shows around the united states but it wasn't like their long touring portion and you know they were exhausted and like it was post show and then they were like they told us like how many dates they had set up for 2019 and it was and it was something like i don't know it was over 200 yeah and after watching them we we're just like how the hell are you going to survive this yeah like, i mean they did thankfully but like i'm it's, sure they're a little bruised up you know i mean like they're, they're definitely one of the wilder bands which i've seen i mean like cause when they because when they played the exchange they had uh, Chris from Mets was playing bass for them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was at, uh, he came to the shows that we played with them. He's, yeah, he's really nice too. Um, he's an absolute sweetheart. I mean, yeah. he's, he's how I managed to get into that gig because it was an overly sold show. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. He basically just said, hey, yeah, I'll just stick you down and be like, okay, <laughs> I'm coming then. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, like, I think back to the, those nights now, and it's like, I feel like I did appreciate the, them at the time, but I wish that I, like, could just have, like, a video recording of what happened in my head, because, like, Charlie, like, he broke a guitar, like, literally, like, smashed a guitar the first night, Ow. and I think it was just the split moment decision, but then it was very clear, it's like, Charlie, we're playing another show tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna, you're gonna have to go get like a backup. Like I don't know what you're gonna do, but <laughs> you see, you know, sometimes we get carried away. Yeah, I think he got a bit carried away. It was like we played the last note, and then all of a sudden, I I feel the ground shake, and I look over, and Charlie has broken the guitar in half, and I'm like, okay, good night, everybody. Like, <laughs> it's for like it's for like his his the show definitely ending. Right, yeah, it's, it's done. It's done. <laughs> Moment. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, Charlie, we're not big enough yet for you to like smash any guitars. Like, nobody's going to give you a free guitar. <laughs> yeah. Just <laughs> some time. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I think. Yeah, I mean, we'll break one every night if it's a free one. <laughs> I think that's what, well, that's what Pete Townsend did, wasn't it? He was mm -hmm. the, like, the, the Gibson kept on giving him free guitars. So he's like, right, okay, I'll smash this one. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, there's only so much storage space. You got to put it somewhere. <laughs> oh, you could use it for kindling. Yeah, that too. That too. <laughs> if you get, if you really get that bad, it's like, hey, we're we gonna kick dinner on an open fire. Yeah, seriously, on the road, just go camping. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, but I mean, like, I guess that one of the wildest shows and one of the most funly wild shows that I've ever seen was um, was a band called La Savvy Fab. Oh, I feel like I've seen that name uh, and type. Yeah, yeah. They used to be like, um, they were like in a quite quite big kind of post-punky outfit. But oh, their, cool. their lead singer is one of the most mental frontmen I've ever seen. I mean, like, I include Iggy Pop in this kind of list. Oh, wow. The insane frontman. Um, and he's, I, I basically like describe him as like a 16 stone version of Iggy Pop. Wow. It was like... The only other time I've ever seen someone semi-deliberately electrocute themselves on the stage oh my was God. <laughs> Savvy Fab. And it was, it was like, it was a mixture of them having really good songs. Mm -hmm. The ability of what the frick was the singer going to do next. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Sometimes there's bands that are like that where it's just like, I don't, like, do you guys know what you're doing? Or are you guys all surprising each other in the moment? <laughs> he, he had a habit of like, liking to get people. And he'd, uh, and he'd like kind of drag them up at the stage and he'd get them to be the mic stand. Like literally get them to hold the mic and then he'd, he'd like body sculpt them into shape using his <laughs> stone body. And like, um, he'd, and like, well, the he, he, sort of thing that he'd do is be like, I saw him like, because they're playing in a venue which had a really low ceiling. So mm -hmm. he'd semi deliberately electrocute himself by unscrewing and rescrewing a load of light bulbs. Yeah. While singing. So he'd like, could it be singing? Could it unscrewing one light bulb? Then it'd be like, so it, then I like, could have started screwing another light bulb and start switching them around. <laughs> it's like kind of juggling with the light bulbs. And then, oh my God. He, um, well, this it's like one of these shows which I tell people stories from, and they're like, that didn't really happen. It's like, yes, it did. <laughs> um, but he also has a habit of like 
getting into ridiculous fancy dress costumes for different oh, okay. And so he, he was like running around in his giant bright red boxer shorts when he all of a sudden produces this um, baby crab outfit that he managed to stretch over his entire body. Oh and God. <laughs> um, the, the, the craziest part that this is the thing is that the band, he's also like another one of those kind of singers where you go, you're like, how the frick are you still alive? Uh, yeah. Because of like the place they were playing didn't have a properly fixed down stage. So oh, okay. It was, a, it was a temporary, you know, like a temporary stage sort of thing. So he managed to work half of it loose and literally shove half the stage into the middle of the audience. And like, um, so there's people like kind of, kind of like staged having a this two by two meter piece of stage that he, he ripped up and shoved into the middle of the room. It's the only other time, and the promoter was having like, he was putting on the show, was almost having a fatal kind of panic attack. Mm -hmm. Bits of stage scaffolding was like kind of flying around the room. Then he kind of like, the singer basically kind of stopped and just went, kind of blew him a kiss and just said, I think we've got to put the stage back together. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it was like one of those sorts of things where literally people did actually have to wedge the stage back together. Oh my God. Half the band ended up in the audience um, and like kind of half of my friends ended up playing as part of the band. <laughs> That reminds me of like uh, one that we did last year that was like maybe, oh, I've got a couple that I really loved from last year because we played with, I think this is all in the same year, Viagra Boys. Oh, God. Uh, oh, they're, they're wild. Um, <laughs> and uh, Girl Band. Fuck it up. Sweet, sweethearts. Like yeah. the sweetest guys. Um, but then we played with, um, it was Flipper with David Yao from Jesus Lizard doing vocals. They had Martin Atkins from Public Image Limited on drums. Yep. I think I saw that same tour. Do they have Mike Watt? I, uh, no, they did not. They had a different basis for our show. But then in addition, the other opening band, Porcupine, had Greg from the basis from Husker Du. So oh, wow. it was just like murderer's row. Yeah. And that show wound up with uh, people crashing the barriers and jumping up on stage. <laughs> also with the band, this, this, like kind of beautifully unhinged, this girl band. I mean, like, yeah. it's, I, think, I think it's really sad that it's obviously like, because they're, they're singing that has had like really serious mental health problems sort of thing. Right. Um, I mean, I know that there was a period that he, that I think he was living in his parents' garden for about six months. Yeah, I heard something about that, yeah, that like some of the lyrics on one of their records was written during that or something. I mean, he put, I mean, like, that's the thing is, so he put on a lot of weight before they released their second, their second album. It was like saying, because he used to be like a real stick thin kind of character. Mm -hmm. It's like, when they released the second album, I saw a picture of him, it's been like, oh, freaking hell, he's put on a lot of weight. Well, it was really nice because like we, uh, our, so Charlie is a bartender, and uh, after we played the show with them, because I think it was just us and them, we we took them all out to the bar that Charlie works at, and so we closed down the bar. Yeah. And well, if I I had work the next day, and it was it was rough. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but knowing how heavily they drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they they party. They they are the music that they write about. You know. <laughs> They, they are sports team. They are sports. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, we're just as anxious as we sound and everybody else. I mean, there's always a little bit of you that's, you know, truly in there. It can all be character. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of like the beautiful thing about, I mean, I'm going to take this in a completely almost different direction. I find with music is actually how it does connect with the emotions. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've, I've found myself Quite often, I'd decide, but decide between which show I'd go to as to what mood I was feeling in. Mm -hmm. So, if I was feeling in an angry mood, I'd find something angry to like kind of either headbang to, or like if I was feeling in a, I don't know, kind of whatever mood sort of thing. Just yeah, a, I mean, I think even now, like I, I was talking to some friends and we all had this, so I'm curious maybe if you do too. Like, uh, I've been listening to the albums that I listened to when I was about 12. Like, like the real comfort food albums, like 
like for me, like that was like, it was like Kid A, Amnesiac, um, and like Homogenic, Bjork, uh, the first Gorillaz record. Like I know those songs, like backwards, forwards, upside down, nothing's gonna surprise me. And it's just like, it's like literally like having like uh, hot cocoa or something. Like it's just really comforting, you know? Cause I think, I think for me, like I'd probably be going back to more like, cause of like, I'm hitting my late 30s sort of thing. So I'd probably be looking more like at what I was listening to when I was 18, 19 years old. Yeah. That would be like, cause I did, I must admit that Radiohead were like one of those kind of sticking bands where I think I got put off them by their fans. Yeah, but like, I, and but but whereas I got really obsessed randomly by a band called Trans Am, who Trans- are, uh, yes 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 I'm yes I do know them. Yeah, record Redline that was mm-hmm. which opened me like especially sonically to like new concepts. Yeah, and I was listening to a lot of like crossover rock stuff. So like um, bands in the UK like Dub War. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I was also listening to Björk because I, yeah. I he's like one of the people which I do worship, and I would be too scared to say hello to. Oh yeah, no, there's no way, there's no way to hell. <laughs> I probably, it's, I think there's about there's there's like, but there's certain like, I mean, because there are certain artists which you will go like, oh god, I'm going to make an absolute fool of myself if I do meet them. Right, right. I had a case where I did accidentally bump into PJ Harvey once. And I literally did pretty much black out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was it was at a it was, it was at a show in the centre of Bristol in a place called Colston Hall, and um, it was a tribute show to David Lynch. Oh. Uh, it, it was like put together by a guy called David Colston who composed a lot of the soundtracks for like the Lynch films. Mm-hmm. And. Um, so you had like people like Mick Harvey, who used to be in the Bad Seeds, playing. Yep. And you had like Connor Feeney from from like Villagers, mm-hmm. um, Stealing Sheep, who like a kind of weird electro pop band from Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Um, through to like Jenny Beth from Savages, right. um, Stuart Staples from the Tinder Sticks. Basically, it's like a huge all star band, right? All performing the songs from David Lynch films. Mm-hmm. And um, so well, it was like kind of after the show had finished, I remember kind of like getting up from my seat and literally turning around and like kind of both John Parrish and PJ Harvey were, there, were, were stood there. And like, um, and, and like I had John Parrish go, oh, hi, Jeff. But, you know, like, just like he always says hello to kind of like everyone in like a really friendly, unpatronizing way. Right. Um, but I saw PJ Harvey's face and I went, <gasps> and basically I kind of, kind of, kind of semi tripped over my seat, kind of like when I'm going to go and run into a corner. So, I, yeah, she demigod me, 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 and I <laughs> sort of thing. And to make things worse, as I kind of stumbled and I fell and I kind of semi fell into Jenny Beth. Oh, fun! <laughs> <laughs> Just to make things even more awkward yeah, yeah i just like the idea of like stumbling from like one one rock star to another <laughs> just like <laughs> until you stumble outside <laughs> or, 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 or like not so much stumbling it's more like tripping yeah <laughs> they actually always trip over the seats yeah <laughs> it's, it's kind of like but yeah this I mean, like going back to thinking about this whole period has been it has been kind of like quite crazy in some ways, but like I think that it's also I mean yeah, it's brought about times of like reflection, but I've also been watching how people have been adapting to it, yeah, but doing like kind of like streamed performances, and it's kind of gotten to me to think about. Maybe it's this question, which I should. But I'm trying to think, figure out how to phrase this as a question. Um, I mean, do you ever think about how the music that you create affects the environment around you, or takes impact from that? Well, I think, yeah, I think you know, in terms of, I guess I can kind of tackle this in a couple of different ways. Um, I think right now, I think any band feels weird 
taking up space because there are honestly a lot more important things to talk about. <laughs> um, but at the same time, obviously music is important and especially because of the moment that's happening here in the United States. Um, you know, I think we always had this kind of misguided um, belief that you could just make music and then you'd make it and it would go outside of yourself and then it would get judged outside of you. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I think, A, that's not true. <laughs> Music is not a meritocracy. But also B, like, it is important for a band like us to be out there and, and you know, have our faces out there because there just aren't a lot of bands that look like us. And um, we, like, direct and shoot all of our music videos and edit them and color correct them and i was sitting like actually here <laughs> editing the uh that uh, emergency equipment and exits video oh, that's great and oh thanks um that's, but like sorry for butting in but that's actually the song which i heard which kind of oh <laughs> actually tweaked my ears it was actually uh, seeing and seeing that video oh thanks yeah that was like a special one we uh we had to be really really you know we had to plan ahead because we had to shoot that wall everything was happening here so it required a lot of planning and also like when we were doing like the outdoor shooting that was like the first time that i saw like nadia and charlie since everything happened like i hadn't seen them like in months so mm -hmm. it was actually like it, i'm happy to have it just as like a memory of like us and my friend you know me and my friends but um as i was editing it it was like you know i realized that like we had we've never had um, like a live session, like a taped, mm. like we've done radio before, but like that's not with like the video component. Like you can't just like go, go uh, YouTube search us and go find a performance from somewhere that isn't like a cell phone video. And so like, that's something that uh, in terms of like how we make an impression and like what we're looking now is like, we're actively like pursuing getting like a session recorded somewhere just because like, a, who the hell knows when like shows are going to come back and we're not going to do it until it's safe. Yeah. When, like, we're not putting anybody in danger, but also be like, now it's like <laughs> you take stuff for granted so much or you just, you're just moving constantly. So you don't get to reflect and think. And yeah. it's like one of those things where I'm like, wait a minute, all, all of my friends, like all, all of my peers, they all got to get like video sessions and like, why were we never asked? Mm. Um, so now we're just kind of like actively pursuing that to make up for lost time. I think, uh, I think that's also, do you think that's a, is that like kind of like, a kind of, I, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this properly, do, but do you think that's a, a hurdle to you guys being judged as like an image maybe or like on like how you look or something? Yeah, you know, I think like for us, like as a band that's like fronted by two women and like fronted by two women that don't um, present themselves in a way where I think traditionally, like the bands that I grew up with growing up, like if there was a woman, she was the singer, she didn't play an instrument and she was kind of like the woman that's at the front of a ship, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> like I am like the decorative hood ornament. Yeah. Um, so like, like bass player sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like, I think for me, it's like, I, I think, uh, people might not immediately think of us because they don't associate us with what they think of when they think of a rock band. Does that make sense? Like, I don't think people are like actively malicious, no. but I think that it's definitely something like th they maybe think about a different band. Like when they think of like, who do I book for this thing or whatnot, yeah. you know? Whereas in reality, like, you know, we get compared a lot um, they'll try to just figure out a band that has a woman in it to compare us to, mm. whether we sound like them or not. When yeah. in reality, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, like, I would rather get lumped in with like, I don't know, uh, idols or like, you know, <laughs> Jesus lizard or like something like that. But I think like, if, if people don't have like the models in the world to like have language for it, like, it's almost like your brain doesn't jump from yeah. point A to point B, you know? Is it like, I guess that like, sometimes, when you look at something or when you hear it, it's like completely different. So it's like, so if you do have like kind of preconceptions as to what something's going to be like, mm -hmm. sort of thing. And I guess that sometimes that's 
partly what the general public does is they'll, they'll neatly bracket off things and they'll go like, right, that's because it's easy sell. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I think like the kind of energy that uh, whatever you put up puts across, like, I think the really good bands know what that looks like. Like, I think Idols knows what Idols comes across as. Yeah. Like, they know what the, what the hell they're doing. Um, and like for us, like, like we put out, um, like the first single on the record was called Lucky. Yeah. And like that one's like a two dudes having like a drinking vendor shot in reverse. Um, and with that one, like when we were sitting down and talking about like, what is this music video about? And it's like, okay, the song is like about like deep clammy shame, like, like just <laughs> like not cute shame, not like, oopsie, I got drunk, but like, like there's a problem here. Really? Uh, I mean, I'm sorry if you're talking to you, but you can definitely feel that, especially within the lyrics, within the lyrical context of the songs. You def- and I think, like, you're not used to hearing stuff like that coming out of, like, that's that's the song that Nadia sings, and, like, I, you know, I don't think you're ex- people expect to hear stuff like that coming out of, like, a woman's mouth on a rock song, typically. And that's why, like, when we did the video, like, we sat down and we were like, you know, we'd love to, like, cast diversely and, like, no- operate how we normally would for something like this. But for this song, like, I think, like, we just want to have, like, two two dudes. Like, just two dudes, because that's what the song feels like. It'll help, like, people will watch that video, and, like, we show up in the middle of it, but it's, like, you're already halfway in by that point, you know? So, like... <laughs> There's no going back sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, surprise, like... <laughs> but also, but, but that also, that's the thing, is that, that that's... When, the, when I was listening to the record last night, that's one of the things which grabbed me straight away was the the emergency, the emergency of it. The kind of like, and I guess that whenever I think of stuff like that, I always think of like a classic band like X Ray Specs, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. Yeah, I mean like, as if in, but I mean like, but also I really like the fact that. It's a thing which feels like from the songs which I've heard anyway, because I haven't obviously heard the quite the entire thing. Um, but it very much has like kind of like a wider scope, like slightly cinematic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of- that that makes sense because like Nadia works in film mm. and TV. She does like props, and uh, I work in design. So I think like even when we were studying the band, like we were coming at it from a slightly different angle. Cause we were just like in these like creative jobs mm. that like when you get into those fields, like they're not actually that creative. No. And so, yeah. So we were like, it was a really cold Chicago winter. And so we just decided to start tinkering. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of, that makes a lot of sense that you're saying that. Cause like for us, like a song idea starts out by going like, I don't know. Uh, have you ever been invited out to a party, but like you really didn't want to go. And then like, we'll just kind of write that. Yeah. Scene. they're kind of scenes or like little worlds like that it's, we never like have a song that's like like a country song where it's like and then my girl left me and my dog died like like we just don't <laughs> we don't write songs like that so but then that's the thing is that's you being honest to your personality and being honest to like kind of who you are and like yeah. expressing yourselves yeah and i think like when you write in a way that's kind of like outside of yourself and you're writing about a scene and you're writing about like emotions that can be really universal whether that's like regret or whether that's like alienation or whatever um it really helps when it's something like that too because i'll write lyrics that nadia sings Mm. or nadia will write lyrics that i sing so before we even try to make sure that it makes sense to anybody that we is listening we have to make sure that we're making sense to each other. If that makes yeah. Sense. No, no, that, that, that makes complete sense. Because, like, it's kind of, I guess it's kind of similar to the way which, like, Kate Stables from This is the Kit, who's, like, completely different genre of music, but she mm-hmm. has a very similar way of, like, talking about subjects. Mm-hmm. The latest song is basically about, um, I think I think it's like, an, like a protest song for the NHS. Okay. Which, National Health Service, yeah. which pretty much the greatest, this probably the single greatest thing that this that Britain's ever produced. Right. And I like it, and I compare it to like, the way of all my songwriting, there's almost like a weird daydreaminess to it. Mm-hmm. Well, I think yeah. You take that element, but there's also like a grittiness. Mm-hmm. A kind of like a kind of, 
Uh, definitely like a like an unpretentious rage. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like for us, I think we're just trying to make little like snow globes, if that makes sense. Like, like let's take every feeling around like w when you're at a party and you don't want to be there and you would rather just like like literally that song "Emergency Equipment and Exits" is like you could be having you could be at a, like what like the third birthday party for you this year. And you just desperately just want to go run screaming into the woods. And I think everybody has been there before. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. I mean, that song definitely can, like, takes you in some ways in directions which you don't necessarily always expect, like, the first time listening to it. Like, especially with, like, the fact three quarters of the way through, there's almost, like, a kind of jazz breakdown. Kind of yeah. It. And I was like, oh, this is cool. This is taking me somewhere. You know, like, I didn't quite expect it because it was like, because I could hear like a lot of almost kind of crowd rock influences with the pet mm -hmm. rhythms and like kind of mm -hmm. the fact that a, lot, that a lot of your songs would like kind of like have this kind of emergency to them. But then mm -hmm. when it came to the last song, I really did not expect like the horn sound. Oh, yeah. yeah. Are you talking about Bags for Life? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That one, that one was really fun because uh, that was the first time that we've ever brought horns into the studio. We had a couple of horn players come in. And we just like built a horn section um and so that was fun like actually like writing out sheet music because like i played in the orchestra as a kid so like i just was like <laughs> like literally writing sheet music which we'd never do um but yeah that was a fun one and like um i love that it, by the way oh thanks yeah that one uh it was there's a comedian an irish comedian named uh david o'doherty yeah. um and he has a song called Life. And in the middle of the song, he, he calls life a bag for life or it's like a bag for life. And I'd never heard that term before. Mm -hmm. And I, I just have like a, a notebook like or like a notes folder in my phone that I just like dot down words that I think are interesting. And that literally just was in my phone for years. <laughs> I was waiting for a place to put it. So that was fun. But our producer, uh, Mia Clark, from Electrolane, mm. there was definitely one where she's like, why is the song called this? And I'm like, I don't know, it just feels right. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about Electrolane, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> actually, the first ever time I went to Festival Festival, I saw my, my main highlights, Pop and Beastie Boys, were Electrolane. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, she she's an absolute gem, absolute sweetheart. It was, it was great that uh, we got to have her in studio and um she i don't know if this is like a if she has like signature moves but um she has a thing that she's done with electrolyte and she'll take her guitar and bend it over an amp yeah and there's a there's a song that'll be out at the like right before the album drops where she showed charlie how to do that <laughs> but i have like video like phone video of like mia like going like no charlie you do it like this and like <laughs> i mean like it's it's it, I mean, like, so, so I remember saying, yeah, because I remember them, I remember her doing that actually at festival. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's amazing that I can remember that because I've been up for like, let me think, 48 hours. But yeah, that, oh wow. <laughs> like, well, the thing is, is that sometimes when I go to festivals, especially if it's my first time, I get overly excited. I become like mm -hmm. a in the sweetie shop. Yeah. It's been some times where, like, for instance, like, festival or another one of the festivals where I literally haven't been able to physically sleep because <laughs> partly of having the fear of missing out and yeah so, so excited that you can't calm down <laughs> yeah I definitely had that last year with we played Riot Fest um which is like a, a largest festival it's not like Glastonbury or anything but it's like it's large in Chicago and it was one of those things where we played and then we had to rush to go put away our equipment and get back because right after us on our stage, it was Nick Lowe and then it was B-52s. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So it was like, get back as quickly. Like, <laughs> forget about the guitars. We just want to go back and watch B-52s. And then it was like, we watched B-52s backstage. Like, and then we went and saw Ride. Yeah. And it was just like, it was insane. And then, the night ended with Slayer. Like we got to watch Slayer backstage and it was like, oh. I like, it was one of those moments where like, I've never seen that big festival, like people passing out and getting like carried over 
from the front, yeah, it is overwhelming. <laughs> Man, it's, it's, it massively is. I mean, like, yeah. I guess uh, it's, I'm just trying to think of things again. Um, I guess that, that when it I mean, like, because obviously, like, when you see stuff like Glastonbury and stuff like that, you don't realize actually how big it really is. Yeah. I mean, Glastonbury's festival site is over three miles, sort of thing. I mean, it looks like it. We've been watching videos. Yeah, well, I've, I've been, I've, I was at some of those sets, actually. Yeah. Like, if you watch, like, I mean, I was at David Bowie at 2000. Oh, wow. When I was 17. Wow. In the audience for that, um, so, um, I appear on the screen for Blur when... Ah. Blur 2009. Oh, that's awesome. I wish I got to see Blur. That's like, I love Blur so much. And yeah, they, I think Damon touches. <laughs> really, really good. But they, I was still in absolute awe of, the, of Nick Cave and the Bad Sea Tour on just before them. And there's yeah. my first time in seeing Nick Cave. And I was just like, holy, you know, like when you see mm-hmm. something so intense, it's just like, how can you follow that up? Yeah, for sure. And like his, like, uh, I saw him last year do, it was just like solo piano. It was that red right hand thing where people would ask questions and then he'd like play a song on the piano and then he'd answer some questions. And uh, question and answer sessions always make me really nervous because people ask really bad questions. (laughs) Typically, you know, they're like, they'll talk about themselves forever and then like kind of get a question in. (laughs) <laughs> but like somebody would ask like a really awkward question and he would answer answer it gracefully and be like well now i'm going to play a song on piano and the entire mood of the like room <laughs> of the theater would just change like from like uh professor q a <laughs> like feeling to like oh no like nick cave is going to end the world with this piano <laughs> <laughs> but i mean that, that that was like one of those kind of classic years at glastonbury where they had three classic headliners and mm-hmm. only three of the festivals that I've got to see some of the bigger acts. So they had like Neil Young on the Friday night. Wow. I was on the barrier for that as well. Wow. Um, they had like, it was like Neil Young and the specials on the Friday. The Saturday was Bruce Springsteen. Oh, wow. It's typical three hour set. You know, he's like, he, he doesn't, he doesn't short change people at all. Right. Right. Uh, Where's that? Yeah, it was, yeah, Glastonbury Festival. So that would have been 2009, I think that was. Yeah, it was 2009. Yeah, I mean, I, with these big festivals, it's like one of those things where I, I'm more worried about the small clubs, you know, obviously. Because I don't know about the ones by you, but like, there's just no way. Like, they're just so little black boxes. There's just, there's just yeah. no way. I think for us, it's going to be, we're going to try to figure out how to get us filmed so, you know get something up that way so because we didn't get to have a, we're not gonna have a release show <laughs> yeah. which is like the weirdest thing in the world like i'm sorry like we we made this album for a year i want a party <laughs> maybe what you should have is you should have a, like an album an album knowledge zoom chat so- yeah you know like i i know that like people have been doing like like uh listen along parties like like tim burgess was doing like s- some of those too He's been he's been organizing so many of them. He's been doing like four a day. Yeah, like, it's wild. It's things as well. Yeah, it's 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 kind of crazy. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see what we can figure out. I'm not quite sure what it, release day will look like. I'm just hoping that we can film ourselves in some way so that you know um, the people that you know aren't in the U.S. that haven't been able to like see us play can actually see us play. So <laughs> about you, the, the, there's. There's, there's definitely really interesting things that you can do, which other artists haven't thought about. Because mm. one of the things I watched last night, um, after listening to your record, or, or most of it anyway, mm. um, I watched my friend Kayla Painter, who's a really amazing electronica producer. Mm-hmm. And stuff with um, like found sounds. Okay. So it'd be like kind of like sometimes her entire like tracks we made up of literally her ripping bits of tape. But what she was doing, she she works with a live visual projectionist. Mm-hmm. And so um, she was doing what they call a site specific performer, performance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So she was performing from her, like, kind of her studio. Mm-hmm. 
uh, Jason, her projectionist, had gone out into like this, pa this patch of countryside with the, with this sort of thing and was projecting the visuals. Mm -hmm. That she was that through each one of the sets that she's done, she's changed it to suit the environment. So it's That's like cool. it's like and it's so like one of the first ones she did was being projected up against you know a huge abandoned like kind of block of flats sort of thing. Right. So it's like a lot more industrially, a lot more like. But then it's also kind of playing with how. You know, the sun, the setting sun sort of thing, how the light was changing and then it was getting more darker and more like right. kind of atmospheric in that kind of way. Yeah, I'm hoping that we can film ourselves in an interesting location. I mean, I know some folks are filming themselves in venues, which is fine. Yeah. But without an audience, like, why? You know, like, why do you need a traditional stage? Like, there's a couple places in Chicago, whether they be like, like there's literally a place that I'm thinking about that's a bar slash bowling alley. Well, hey. so, like, that's where I want to be. Like I want to be like in a really cool environment like that. Cause like if there's not people, it's like yeah. you can you can literally be anywhere. You know, we could be in a hardware store. You know, like pretend to get bowling whilst playing. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, actually, to be honest, we have like a couple of venues a bit which are a bit like that in Bristol. Mm -hmm. Um, like we have like. Play, there's a place called The Lanes, which mm -hmm. is an old rally, and mm -hmm. but they also put on really cool gigs. But they're they're owned by, admittedly, a massive kind of corporatization because they're owned by the people who own Brooklyn Brewery. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like when I say like they've also had a lot of money, so like they, but it's a really great sounding room. Right. So like for like shows and sort of thing, and also like the guy the. The guy who's the manager of the place, he's like really good with local promoters. Mm -hmm. He always like kind of makes sure the bands get paid, kind of um, also um, makes it so so quite a lot of the shows can be free entry or very very cheap tickets sort of thing. Right, right. Just to like encourage people through the doors, but he's also the fact that he lets you know the venue out for free and stuff like that. So it's like free hire and so much those sorts of things yeah definitely definitely yeah i think the live stream thing is still kind of being worked out because it's like there's just part of me where i'm just like it's just it's missing that thing like you were saying it's missing the thing that like personally that like you know i don't know how i would feel charging someone 15 bucks i'd happily pay on a screen, you know i think i would happily pay if it's going to support the artist and if it's you know supporting someone that I care about, then yeah, I would happily pay. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's one of those things where we're seeing that right now with sites like Bandcamp, you know, like that have really made like releasing an album during this time period possible at all, to be quite frank. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think people are proving that like, you know, people will, will pay to support the art that they love, which is great. You know, I think it's just a matter of making sure that like <laughs> everybody who listens to music is taking care of themselves. All the artists are taking care of themselves and, and just trying to figure out how we can kind of hold out. I know exactly what, I know exactly what you do mean sort of thing. Case of like, I was, I was, I had this discussion with one of the other chats with my friend Nadine, who's like kind of, she's a really amazing kind of alternative, slightly post punky kind of like new wavy artist sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but the way I see it is if, if, you know, if there's an artist, if that's your, your income's completely gone, yeah, then you kind of, you can't necessarily always be asking everyone for change. But right. if you said like, look, if you charge something because you're providing a service, right? They, you know, like, cause there's loads of people doing stuff for free, but also like, but if you're doing, but you know that if you're paying for something then you get high quality right exactly and like i think part of the reason like we've been okay is that like a we've got something to keep us busy because we have an album coming out but b it's like we ha we have a physical good <laughs> you know it's like buy the physical good yeah you know it would be different if we were like between records or something i would imagine we'd feel a little bit stranger about it all you know yeah but then it'd be like kind of then i guess uh, it's also like kind of a good time to like 
I'm not quite sure how to put it into words, like reevaluate kind of um, like what we see as our achievements sort of thing. You know, like um, the fact that you put out, two, you know, this is like your second record. That, that's definitely yeah. something that needs to be like kind of a round of applause. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, it's definitely like an endurance test, I feel like, you know, but that's kind of part of it too, is that like this record's kind of about trying to be a better person and failing in that sometimes and you don't really get like a reward for it but I think coming off of the first record and the first time that we like toured the U.S. as a band like it's just it's just hard yeah. and the bands that are really good you have to kind of learn how to be a little emotionally intelligent and to be really kind yeah um and that was kind of the process of all of this and honestly like again I don't think that we'd be able to navigate right right now if we didn't spend all of 2019 <laughs> recording like 15 songs and yeah. like having to practice being very good to each other, you know, um, I could see a lot of bands having a lot of problems right now. If you just, if you haven't been practicing, you know? Yeah. I mean, also like, I guess it's, if you're used to being like around people, then the isolation probably would kick in a lot worse. If, whereas if you're like, where it's like, I mean, I was kind of semi used to it because I live on my own anyway. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference when you choose to be isolated, whereas when, when it's forced isolation, it's very different. Yeah, it is. And it's made, I mean, this time it's made a lot more, the emotions a lot more highly intense. Yeah. Because of like, you feel like we don't have, you know, like my way of escaping it would be to go to a gig. Right. <laughs> like, how do I emotionally deal with this situation? So, you know, like you'd find ways to, like, de-stress. Right. You know, like, like in 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 the UK, we've been having, you know, like illegal raves happening. Oh, the, really? <laughs> because the young kids need to, you know, so they need to de-stress. You know, you need to. Right. Otherwise, you'll end up with potentially an even worse mental health crisis than probably what we've got at the moment yeah i mean i've already told everyone in the band it's like it's gonna be weird but it's like once this is you know once the album's out and you know it becomes a little bit more calm again like you know we've written here and there but you know i've been trying to kind of focus on what we're about to put out but it's like we may just want to dive right back in i know that typically you know I, I like sitting with the record a little bit and like letting your life have a little bit of distance until the next time you try to go put something down. But it might be something where once fall comes around, we're going to be stir crazy, you know? Um, and, you know, I think like you were saying, if you just operate in the ways that you thought you think you can operate from before, you know, whether it's, that's how you de-stress or whatever, like yeah. it's just not going to work. Like you, we have to just take every single thing as if this is a new time period. Cause it is, you know, and nothing's the same and it probably won't ever be the same, you know, which is, which is, which is partly also kind of odd, but then it's also like, we've got to look at what potential barriers we could be facing, I guess. Yeah. Like also that, I mean, in the UK, they've started to announce drive, like, kind of drive-in gigs. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. like, kind of like, sort of thing where it's like socially distanced gigs, where it's been like, that kind of, for me, just feels like a weird 1950s B-movie experiment. Yeah, it's just, yeah, no. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, the idea, yeah. the sort of thing which Fritz Lang would be writing about, where we're all, like, kind of pretending to be androids sort of thing, and just like, yeah it. yeah it's very like let's go do this collective activity in a very isolated individual way it's like but you, you, no it just it it's just like it's really weird so i was watching like um footage of a kind of driving gig in germany mm -hmm. they decided to, to try and do like you know like, like kind of go out to the audience sort of thing right like, literally kind of wandering in amongst all these parked cars with like the kind of like metal head fans <laughs> the windows <laughs> no no <laughs> oh it was i'm out i'm out i'm sorry <laughs> he says it all 
Yeah, yeah, no, it's just, I don't know. I, I miss it desperately, but like also we just can't, not until like it's, not until it's 100% safe, it's just not, there's just no way. And you know, it's just, I think the only thing that we can do is we can all agree that it sucks. <laughs> Like, but, but um, but also when like, it also did make me think about you know like how could we do the social distancing at shows you know like, so one of the, one of the ways which I thought of, it'd be a bit like kind of, would would be to like, get the bands to play, but then like kind of give people loads of easels to get people to like draw or paint the bands so they can like. Oh yeah, yeah. Me involved with the performance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I like that. You know, that's I like that a lot. You know, like they they could be doing something which involves, like, you know, people controlling like live visuals. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Uh, yeah, just something that kind of gives a little bit more interactivity. Yeah. Yeah, but then also like you could also blend it into certain extent with like almost virtual reality. Oh yeah, there's there's a some interesting people doing some stuff like that. Um, like, have you ever heard of Panther Modern? Uh, no, I haven't heard of it. So it's a new project by a uh, dude that was in a band called Sextile. Um, but he, I think, I don't know if it was his job, but he's a like a 3D renderer. Wow. And he's been doing some interesting live stream stuff that's really cool, where like it puts him like in a environment. <laughs> So it looks kind of like you're watching like a video game or something. Like it's it's pretty cool. Like it's hard to explain. I'll I'll send you a link on on Twitter. Well, that'd be amazing. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. I guess so. But then I guess that kind of goes back to like thinking of how, like, the environment. Because obviously he's putting himself in a fake environment. How that impacts on his art. Yeah, for sure. And like, I think it works for certain art better than others. I mean, the reason why we haven't done a live stream thus far is because honestly, it suits electronic acts way more yeah. right now than it would a full band, you know, like the amount of effort <laughs> just to just get the band sounding good for everyone would be so much more than someone who can just press play and so, have like a microphone with a little bit of reverb, you know? Yeah, but also like, I've, I've also found that with obviously like the live streaming of shows sometimes i'll be doing because like i'll be going on like walks in the nearby parks mm-hmm. playing music on my phone not through headphones just generally blaring it out and yeah. you know like kind of trying to trying to see how the, the the like the birds and the wildlife around me is reacting to me yeah you know to see if they're changing are they changing to the rhythm of the music <laughs> you know yeah, because I mean, it's not a one-way dialogue, you know, it's it's two-way for sure. Two or th- probably even three-way sometimes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Because <laughs> also like, like whenever I hear, it's like whenever I hear certain tones or sounds of the music, I'll, it'll always make me feel certain things. Oh, kind of like a synesthesia-y kind of a thing, or like... Kind of, but mm-hmm. it, like I'll notice like my emotions will react in a certain way. Mm-hmm. You know, like, so if you hear, like, I guess, like, that's part of the reason why sometimes I'll go and see a band like Sun, who, like, yeah. drink yeah. metal outfits, is because of it's, like, going to a hypnotic sound bath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. You I know, know exactly what you mean. You're going for, like, the experience. Mm-hmm. See someone like More Mother, who's yeah. probably the single most punk artist I've seen. <laughs> I mean, like... Yeah, totally rad. Yeah. Her shows are freaking amazing. If you, have, mm-hmm. be, you you obviously must have come across her stuff. Yeah, I mean, I've listened to her before. Unfortunately, I've never seen her live. But, um, yeah, very familiar. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, like, yeah, the last time she, she played Bristol back in February. And mm-hmm. it was brilliantly intense but also like kind of in a really good way uncomfortable because she was asking really challenging questions mm-hmm. the audience because it was like mm-hmm. the predominantly mostly kind of white yeah audience sort of thing and a lot right. of stuff is obviously reflective of things to do with like kind of racial issues and like mm-hmm. and also sexist and issues sort of thing mm-hmm. and it was that sort of thing where you kind of felt brilliantly, like, kind of uncomfortable, but for a good reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, 
interesting shows like that that are a provocation because like, there's definitely artists that project outward and really affect the environment around them in a way that sometimes feels as if they are trying to control like the the direction of that energy that kind of like that dialogue and flow and it's i always find it really fascinating when an artist opens it up to let the energy come back to them you know because in some ways i feel like that's like the tougher position it's really easy to yell into a powered microphone at a crowd that you will just be louder than like yeah. that's easy i think the hard thing is putting silence out there or putting something more receptive out there yeah i mean like like another incident so it's a guy um who i've seen a few times called dean blunt mm -hmm. kind of i describe his music him as like a kind of very left field like kind of r&b artist okay his shows deliberately make people feel as uncomfortable as possible okay one of those <laughs> oh yeah no he's he's freaking amazing but it's literally like they'll literally start with 10 minutes of like of a, of a loop running and it'll be oh, gosh it'll be, it'll be like a pitch black mm -hmm. so i saw him it was like the sound of uh raindrops for about solidly 10 minutes then the second time I saw him, it was um, a loop taken from from one of his records, where it's like, yeah, the white guy's here to save us again, and the white mm. man to save us again, and the white man's here to save us again, for like solid 10 minutes. And then he comes out with his um, like kind of semi-backing band. So he used to have like a woman called Inga Copeland who'd play like guitar and tricking off loops with him and like a saxophone player. And he also, the one thing that he requests on the rider for every single show is to have, uh, you know, like his local security guard to be on the stage with him. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing is that he turns it into like a conceptual joke. So it's okay. like the way making the security guard feel insecure. Oh, okay, gotcha, 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 gotcha. Like, he'll like, but he'll also like flood the stage three quarters, like, on the set mostly with like a dry ice. Mm -hmm so you could barely even see him and his whole thing is that there's deliberately there's no interaction in between him and the audience oh okay gotcha that's what this this security's job's got to do yeah and like he'll all of a sudden he'll hit people with like kind of distortions so it'll be like okay. so he'll, he'll do like two or three songs and like everyone would be like kind of starting to you know ease and like kind of like be getting into it all head nodding then it would hit people with distortions. It would, it would like, it would, so like, the last time I saw him, he ended up doing it twice. And he had, oh, yeah. like the first time it was like the bass, you know, the low end kind of frequencies. Mm -hmm. Different mini earthquake kind of going off. Oh yeah. Then he'd play a couple more songs and people would start relaxing, get back into it. And then this is when he hit them with the high end. And he, <laughs> left, he left the stripes running for about 25 minutes. Oh gosh. It's literally like a sip, you know, like the equivalent of feeling like as if you're on a rocket ship, kind of going right, up. Right. Apart from people who were there were expecting the drop, and it's been like, no, 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 <laughs> definitely not going to happen. Yeah, the uh, there is always that element of like, how uncomfortable do you make them? Like, I think the the most uncomfortable I've been at a show was just the sheer volume of seeing swans at a large theater. No. <laughs> The, the volume in the like the vestibule, like the the foyer, like outside of the actual like space of the theater, that was normal concert venue. Yeah. Like volume. And yeah. then when you went inside, it was like double that. And like I was wearing like earplugs like for playing. Yeah. And I looked around and there were some people that were not. And I was like, this is just dangerous at this point, <laughs> you know? So yeah, it can be a little complicated it's also having really, that confrontation. But then it's also really weird how also like different sounds can actually affect, you know, like the human body in different ways. Right, definitely. You can have like, like obviously I mentioned thy son, which is like loud, but it's like it can really weirdly calming effect. Mm -hmm have like the swans where it's sort of like mostly the high end and like kind of right frequency crashing or you could basically like have like the bass end where it's like a kind of brown noting 
Yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see like how the the prospect of not playing anything that you're writing right now anytime soon live, how that's going to affect the kinds of music and the kinds of sounds that people are writing. Because mm. I think there's definitely sometimes when you're writing like on emergency equipment, there was definitely a challenge to myself where I was like, I want to do a song that goes at 100 miles an hour and then stops. Yeah. And that's partially because I was thinking that's, that'd be cool to do live. Yeah. <laughs> Little did I know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's just going to be interesting now just thinking about if we were to record something and release it soon, mm. like something in addition later on this year or something. Yeah the first time people are going to hear it is going to be headphones, yeah. you know, or their like home hi-fi. So like, that's, that's interesting too. It might change the way in which people write, you know? Also, yeah. like as, as someone who listens, cause like I became a few years ago, I became like a resident DJ at Green Man Festival. Oh, cool. Like how, how I found, um, you know, like when I'm buying records, when I'm coming across stuff, I think, would this sound good on the dance floor? Exactly. Myself, losing, losing myself for this. I mean, exactly. I, I can safely say there's, there's definitely a good few songs on the new record, which I could definitely imagine <laughs> right into the center of it, just, just like completely losing my shit, basically. Yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see like what people do with stuff now. Like, I really love like the 90s like trend of like, you would take a song, and I'm trying to think, like Pulp had a lot of these, where you'd have the single version, but then they would make like an extended dance mix. Yeah. But it wouldn't be like dance mixes of like electronic music, it would be dance mixes of like rock music. And that's something that like, I don't know, like that's something, I feel like we'll figure out ways to entertain ourselves. <laughs> like, I guess I thought of like, there's this thing which I went to see, um, this guy, he, who used to work for like Island Records back in mm -hmm. the 60s and 70s. He was a massive Nick Drake fan. Okay. And um, his, his basic job used to be, um, the reason why I bring this up is because of like, it made me think of like, how we could listen to songs in a different context. Right. Because if he did this project where he found this lo lost Nick Drake recording, mm -hmm. he'd had for like 40 odd years, and no one else had heard it. And it was a, it was a, it was a version of cello song, which is nothing like how it appears on the record. Mm -hmm. um, so he basically what he decided to do with with his brother was basically um, kind of drive around the UK with with a Walkman and a pair of headphones and stop people and play the song and then photograph their reactions. You know? Oh, okay, interesting. So like documenting the the live reaction of it. Yeah, and then like to like, get people to ask their thoughts because like they wouldn't necessarily always say that there, there was Nick Drake's song sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just to get their reactions and, you know, like, thinking about, like, how people have relationships to songs. Yeah, definitely. Because, I mean, I think everybody has, like, their, their favorite songs that will either put them in a very certain headspace or they listen to them on various, for certain occasions. So, yeah, I could definitely see how... I just think that this is going to just take a little bit of, you know, yeah. rethinking about... Why are you doing what you're doing? Mm. You know, like, I, I feel like you, if you were playing music to, I don't know, be popular or, you know, be king of a scene or something, uh, like, the scene's blown up. I don't know. Like, did you really like doing this? Like, if you were on a desert island, would you still be doing it? Yeah. Um, and I think for us, that, yeah, like, I, I think... I think we're just going to continue writing songs and maybe make some dumb movies about it, you know? <laughs> but then the thing is, though, that there, there'll probably be people along the line who'll probably see that, you know, don't know how many years in the future, and they'll go like, wow, this is amazing. People. I, I mean, I like having the documents. It's nice. It's nice. And it's nice to kind of amuse ourselves. Like, that's, that's kind of the primary. <laughs> and hopefully that comes across. Like, we're just, you know. <laughs> it really does, because I think that... You've got to do things for yourself first anyway, you know. Mm -hmm. if yeah, you, we're just really having a laugh. <laughs> no, if you, the thing is, is it, it's like you definitely tell the people who are, like, really being honest to themselves, mm -hmm. you know, because, like, 
because they're the ones which you will emotionally react to because you know they'll be singing about emotions or something or they'll like you know but you can definitely tell those who, who are like doing it all for the right reasons yeah i mean i i hope that that, that comes across and you know and i think that we can we'll be okay kind of um putting away any disappointment you know about not being able to tour on this record anytime soon or come over to the uk um and just put a little bookmark on it and we'll just continue you know amusing ourselves until we can yeah i think that's probably the best thing that we can do really isn't it i mean what else are we gonna do <laughs> Hey Alicia, I think I'm going to, it's all right if I call it there, because I'm like, I think I'm going to go make myself some dinner. Oh yeah, no, go for it. But no, that, that was utterly wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks, Noah. It was really great talking to you and meeting you. Uh, sounds like we have a lot of the same music taste, so send me any recommendations if you have them. I think there's definitely crossovers, that's the thing, that's the way I say it. Is it when, whenever people go, oh, they're not into music, I'm like, bullshit. <laughs> you know, people say that they don't like music. It just means that they haven't necessarily, or that the music which they, they like doesn't necessarily get played on radio. Right, exactly. So, yeah, like I said, you know, especially with, like, the UK scene and the US scene being a little separate, like, if there's anything that you think I haven't heard of, like, I would love to hear it. So just oh, shoot me a DM or whatever. Yeah. There's probably quite a few, especially in Bristol at the moment. There's so many. Yeah, definitely. Okay, well, let's continue the conversation there. Thanks, Alicia. All right, see. Bye. See ya. Bye.